Ich bin über. Uh, welcome. Um, first conference, bla bla bla. Uh, my tab froze. Um, yeah. Servus, good morning. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, most of you will probably uh, have heard of Wolfgang before. If not, he's he's one of the people who for years has invested most of his time into into teaching people how networking works. Um, and he's on on this tireless path on always trying to to bring the networking scene forward by just putting more knowledge out there, which is totally great. We have a first time. Um, this is the first time that Wolfgang will be doing all of those sections at once which will be quite a tour de force that also means we will have a huge amount of questions i suggest that you initially discuss questions in in chat to try and solve them between yourselves and only if you cannot reach uh, a point of conclusion you bounce this up into a question because else we will have an endless amount of questions afterwards and we'll not be able to go through them um, but obviously at any point in time feel free to to ask questions um yeah and with this, over to Wolfgang. Hey, good morning. So, I'm doing this talk in English. <laughs> All right. Uh, but nevertheless, if you want, would like to listen to it in German, part of it is on the Wikix website, pre-recorded in German, and I also would be happy to do that again in German for the whole full two hours, uh, if you just give me a stage somewhere. Okay, how did this talk came to be. So let's start a little bit meta first, uh, talking about the talk. At DKIX, we do have trainees, we do have interns, and when they start, they send them to me first and tell me, hey, Wolfgang, can you please explain to these people what we are actually doing and how the internet works? Well, after I've done that three times with uh, improvised whiteboard sessions and YouTube videos, and then came Corona and I couldn't do my BGP seminars anymore. So I finally had the time to write down the stuff I was teaching to these interns over and over again. And this is basically how it started. And like any good book or any good presentation, I did not start at the beginning. I started in the middle, uh, worked my way up, worked my way forward. But at the end now I have six, seven half hour presentations, how the net, I called it networking basics. I was thinking about how the internet works, uh, whatever. So I called it networking basics and it basically covers everything starting from Ethernet up to TCP and the rest isn't written yet. I'm currently writing about DNS, but that's not complete. If I have enough time, which I doubt, I can show you the unfinished slides about DNS, but I think we are going to start here at the agenda. Uh, by the way, I'm not doing any break unless I myself need one. We are all at home. We are all sitting in front of a screen. A lot of us have wireless headphones. So if you need a break, just step out and come back. I'm not doing too fast and uh, there is plenty of time. Also, I have certain points in my presentation where it's suitable for questions. Uh, uh, Richie will moderate them and uh, I will say, okay, now please give me all the questions which lined up, but I can see the chat as well. So, but I don't stop myself because yesterday my BGP talk, uh, usually the questions came two slides later, so I had to jump back and I not, do not want to do that today. So that's the agenda. We're starting with the very basic stuff, we go up the layers, we talk about Ethernet, we talk about IP, we talk about UDP, TCP, ICMP, and let's see how far we get in these two hours. I'm going to keep my time, I'm going to finish on time. I have a big clock here in front of me. So let's get started about networks. So what are networks? Networks. networks are everywhere. You all know and use networks. And I'm not talking about the internet here. I'm talking about the networks all around us, like the road network. This is actually a network. And what makes it a network? It connects cities. 
using roads and cars. You can step out of your house, you use a road, you go to someplace else. So it's actually, it is a network. Another example, the railway network, it uses rails, trains to connect railway stations, also a very, very big network. And that work of the electrical grid. So this connects producers and consumers of electricity. And here we have a little bit of kind of different network. We have producers and consumers. So we have two roles in the network. While the road network, everybody is equal. The network is the postal network. Yes, and I also consider this to be work. You can send packets. You send letters and packets, and uh, there are senders and receivers. And uh, isn't that a little bit like the internet, especially since you're in packets? Okay, talking about packets. Well, at the postal network, just imagine you have seen this nice garden shed here in a catalog, and you would like to have it in your garden and uh, you want to order it. Uh, well, what are you doing? You're going in ancient times. You had a paper catalog, you opened it. Oh, I want this garden shed. And, but it doesn't fit into one package. It doesn't, the postman can't bring it to your door. It's way too big. So what happens? The sender dismantles it and puts it into lots and lots of little packages and uh, sends them to you. And what you do when you arrive uh, 20, 50 packages of wood, well, you put it, you unpack it and you put it together again and you have a garden shed. And computer networks and the internet, they work in a similar way. So data isn't sent in one whole, whole big blob, not as a whole. It's split it into packets by the sender. The packets are sent over to work one by one, and uh, the deliverer puts it together again. And to make that work, there are so-called network protocols. And network protocols take care that the transmission is successful. When I first started explaining that to non-technical people about the internet, I usually, well, you know, you just you use the term protocol a lot. Then somebody asked me, what actually is a protocol? <sighs> okay, for non-technical communities, this isn't as common as it is for us. So what is a protocol? If you want to communicate with someone, you need to speak a common language. Uh, otherwise, you will, won't understand each other. So the same is with systems, with computers on the internet. You need to have a common language everybody understands. And this is called a protocol. A protocol is a common language between two systems so they can communicate with each other. And the protocol we used on the internet is called IP. IP stands very simply for internet protocol. And actually at the moment, there are two versions of IP being in parallel. The old one is called IPv4 and the current one is called IP v6 and i'm going to talk about ip a lot of ip i'm going to talk with later there will not be a webinar about ip there is one and it's happening in about an hour other protocol for example for your local network there is a protocol at home that's called ethernet and uh, you all have seen this uh, plugs in your router and uh, yeah, that's easy. But you're also using IP. Are you using two protocols now? Yes. Don't be confused. Multiple protocols are used. And this is what we call a protocol stack. 
you might have heard about this, the OC reference model. You have heard about it perhaps in school, at your education. Uh, it's quite always present. But what is it? The OC protocol stack uh, was a model how protocols on different so-called layers work together. OC stands for Open System Interconnection, and that was a project at the International uh, Standardization Organization. And in the 1970s and 1980s, they sat together, produced a lot of paper, and defined how a vendor-independent protocol stack can work. Because at that time, there were already network protocols, but they were invented by companies, by different vendors, each had their own, and they were not really compatible to each other. So the ISO said, okay, let's set together, let's define a framework, let's make a definition how an open protocol stock might look like, and this was the OC reference model. But in practice, that never took off. There have been implementations, pure implementations of OZ, but they were not very successful. It is still relevant as a model for teaching, but in practice, the OZ stack is dead. I know there are different opinions on that. How is it still? Uh, it was intended really as a working network. Uh, it did have a lot of good ideas, like the separation of layers and the layers building on each other. Uh, but while the OC guys were writing stacks of paper, the internet guys were implementing code. So, uh, well, are you using OC network or are you using internet? Well, we know you have one there. And uh, someone says here in the chat, the play-in von Wolfgang kommt nicht sauber rein. Okay. I have no idea what that means. Um, okay, I simply continue talking. Uh, okay, and despite all the money, there was lots of money in, in OC, uh, lots of uh, money put into that, into universities and so on, but internet won because they had actually running code. The internet model looks, as you can see here, quite a bit simpler than the OC model. Also, the internet model is not as strict as uh, the OC model. It also has layers and uh, it doesn't fit exactly. So it's, it's quite similar. The layers are there and, uh, but there was also no intention to be compliant to OCD idea with this internet was running code and get it to work and uh, have it optimized, have it fast because 1980s, well, computers were way, way slower at that time. And uh, to implement strict OZ, the systems were just not up to it. So running code, most important for the internet. But as I said, we also have layers uh, in the internet model and uh, let's start bottom up. Let's start with the physical layer and uh, the physical layer is really its physics. It's uh, light, it's electrical impulses via a medium, via a fiber or via a cable. So uh, this is the so-called physical layer. You can touch it, and if you touch it the wrong way, it gives you, gives you an electrical shock. <laughs> or if you look into it and the laser is on, don't do that. Don't ever do that. That's the physical layer. Example, like I said, optical transceiver or electrical Ethernet part. One up, we have the so-called link layer. Here, the data units are called frames, and uh, that provides an point-to-point -point and node-to-note -node data transfer from my computer via a cable to the router over there. And uh, examples for that are, of course, Ethernet and also, for example, point-to-point -point protocol, which gets less and less 
important. Okay, one layer up. That's the well, the most interesting layer for the most of you. That's the IP layer or the internet layer. Data units here are called packets. So keep that in mind. When someone talks about frames, he usually talks about Ethernet. When someone talks about packet, he talks about IP and internet. The IP layer does not only provide point-to-point -point transport, it provides a source-to-destination transport from my system here to Australia, all over the world, source-to-destination. And for that, we need addresses for hosts. And uh, two protocols, like I already mentioned, are here, and one is IPv4 and the other one is IPv6. Next layer up, that's the so-called transport layer. And the transport layer, well, it may provide flow control, reliability, and congestion avoidance. I say may provide because there is more than one protocol on the transport layer, and not all of these features are implemented in all protocols. And uh, it also does contain some information about the next layer up. An example for protocols here are TCP, which does implement all these features, or UD, which actually does implement none of these features, except info about the next layer up. And on the top uh, is the so-called application layer, and uh, there is no special name for the data units, and it contains all the uh, application protocols like uh, SMTP, HTTP, lots of buzzwords here. Basically, uh, that's where your web browser and your email and everything is working on. So, at the end of each part, there is a little bit of conclusion, but I think you should remember, well, networks are everywhere. Data is not sent as a whole, but it is sent in packets over a network. And a protocol is a common language, so devices can speak to each other over a network. And the OC model defines a network as a number of slayers but the internet doesn't exactly fit into the OC model. And this is the first break for questions. So if, any, if there are any questions, uh, just let me know. Okay. All right. If there are no questions, let's continue. Talking about Ethernet. And this was actually the first part of this whole presentation I wrote. And uh, that's where I got started talking about Ethernet. So here we go. Ethernet. It's a modern Ethernet device. That's a Nokia 7950, we, like we are using at DKIX. It connects hundreds or even thousands of devices. It uses optical interfaces and with speeds of up to 400 gigabits per second. So that's an Ethernet device, uh, but also a device. That's your router at home. Uh, it connects four devices and it uses copper interfaces and here with speeds up to one gigabit per second. And if you have seen any network drawing ever, you might notice that the symbol of Ethernet in a network plan looks like this. Now, where does that come from? Let's go, Let's go back to the 71 and let's go to Hawaii and there they had a network called AlohaNet. 
the university campus of uh, the University of Hawaii was spread out over several islands and uh, they didn't have any cables, any sea cables in between them. So what they did is they built a radio based network to interconnect their university sites. And this radio network, it has a very simple principle. Well, if you have data to send, send it. That sounds so easy, but it, it wasn't also something new, but it was, that is still the principle where Ethernet is based on. If you have data to send, send it. And uh, the other thing is, if you receive something while sending, stop your sending and try again later. And uh, that was radio based. Let's go forward a few years. Let's go to Palo Alto and about the guy, but Metcalf. And Palo Alto Research Center, they invented a lot of things like the mouse, like the first graphical desktop and so on. And they also were working on network. And instead of radio, they were using a coax cable. A coax cable has some advantages over short distance over radio. It's can transmit a higher bandwidth and it's way more reliable. And, uh, but the idea what you're doing on that coax cable that was inspired by AlohaNet. The whole thing was standardized in 1980. So that's how old it is. And uh, Ethernet 2, which basically is very, very similar to the Ethernet we're using today, was standardized in 1983. So how did Ethernet in these days look like? It did not look like it does today. The first Ethernet being standardized was a fantastic 10 megabit per second. And uh, the cable lengths, the maximum segment lengths they had was 500 meters and they were using a thick coax cable. This yellow cable you see right here, it's about as thick as a finger and that was used for transmitting. And to connect to it, you had a, this is the cable, you had a clamp. You had a clamp uh, and a drill, a clamp for the outer part and a drill for the inner part uh, to connect to your network. And the network, the yellow cable, remember that drawing? The yellow cable was running either on the floor or in the ceiling and you are using these uh, clamps, these vampire clamps, they were called to connect to it. So really drilled into the cable to connect your computer. And uh, uh, yeah, and as you might see, it was something really, really new because it was fast for the time, 10 megabits per second, and it was comparably cheap wasn't as cheap as today, but compared to other things, it was cheap. And uh, the cable they are used, for those of you who have a uh, radio amateur license, it was a 50 ohm coax cable, the same you use today for connecting your antennas. Okay, next step in that, the cable was thick and inflexible. So the next step was, uh, called 10 base 2 and it was a thin coax cable and actually these cables are still used today by radio amateurs like i said to connect antennas and uh, it had a bnc connector like the one you see here and it used these t connectors to connect to network cards maximum length was a bit less so just 200 megabit 200 meters and it was called cheaper net because it was still cheaper, but compared to what the network interface costs today, it was still expensive, but it was still cheaper than anything else. And that was in use in the late 1980s. And I still remember that. So that's when I started with networking. The next standard which came was called 10 base T that was also still 10 megabit per second, but they were used these uh, twisted copper wires, which were cheaper to build, cheaper to manufacture, used a plastic connector, 
but they couldn't they needed an active component the uh the uh Coax cables, they didn't need, and you just needed a cable. You just either drill into the cable or use a T connector, no active component necessary. But big disadvantage, if one host misbehaves, the whole network was down. So if you disconnected the cable behind your desk, uh, your whole floor might go down. So uh, that wasn't so good. So they invented uh, 10 base T, which basically, the, changed the physical topology to something like a star. So you connect with a, like today, you connect with your uh, twisted pair cables to a central device, but it was still 10 megabit only. But Ethernet wasn't the only network at that time. There were competing standards. There was token ring. Uh, that was a network developed by, a by IBM. And uh, it was four megabit per second but it had deterministic access. One of the main criticism about Ethernet always was, oh, it's so random. If somebody else transmits while I want to transmit, I have to stop and wait a random time and then start again. So I will never know when my data is being sent. My data might never be sent. Well, it did. Token ring. Uh, in German, Tota Ring, Dead Ring, uh, was developed by IBM and it had a token running around in the network. So basically a data packet sent from one machine to the next. And when you received the token, you attached your data at the end. When, when you want to send data, you attach your data at the end, send the token to the next host. The receiver takes the data off and sends the token on and on and always circles. And uh, it also had quite a lot of disadvantages. First, it was uh, an IBM network, so they had the patent on it. So everybody who wanted to implement it needed to pay license fees. Uh, also, uh, it was from the cabling way more complex than Ethernet, and it also was more expensive than Ethernet. Still, a lot of people liked it just it was from I because it was from IBM. That's a point where people might disagree. Okay, the next popular network in the 80s and 90s was called FDDI. FDDI was kind of an advanced token ring. It not just used one ring, it used two rings. So if one ring was disrupted, the other one was still there. And it had a fantastic speed of 100 megabit per second. And it was using exclusively fiber. So up to 200 kilometers size using fiber transceivers. Also the frame size, remember frame size? The frame size was 4,352 bytes, while the frame size of Ethernet was 1,500 bytes. And uh, FTDI was fantastic, but it also was made obsolete by faster Ethernet like gigabit Ethernet. And uh, I, I'm really sure if you go to some industry building, you will still find FDDI or, or token ring networks there, even if it's, they are completely outdated. Okay, let's go back to Ethernet and let's go back how Ethernet really works. And this is the core of Ethernet. Ethernet is a broadcast network. It all goes back to AlohaNet, a broadcast network. All devices are connected to a shared medium. One is sending, everybody is receiving. All stations on, at the beginning, the coax cable. Only one station at a time can send data. And uh, if two sta station start sending at the same time as so-called it happens there was a collision so uh you just hear like like uh, if two people in the same room start talking you won't understand anything you might understand a bit from the one from the other but you don't understand anything so the idea by ethernet is if two stations are sending both stop sending and wait for a random time and then they retry and that was 
one of the main criticisms by some people because there was no guaranteed delivery. Uh, your network card might not be able to send because somebody else is taking over the whole network. Shared medium, that means everybody is receiving anything. How now to make sure uh, if if you have a point-to-point -point data transfer between two systems on your shared medium, that not all the other systems are overloaded uh, with unnecessary processing. Well, the idea is each station got a unique 48-bit address. And the address is at the beginning of each of the Ethernet frames. And uh, that could already be processed by the network card. So there was no CPU involved. The network card saw the address at the beginning of a frame. And it, uh, if it matched to its own address, the frame was received and sent on to the CPU for further processing. And uh, if it didn't match, it was simply ignored. So there was kind of a pre-processing of Ethernet frames and still is a pre-processing of Ethernet frames in the network card. And that made it also efficient because, well, shared networks uh, co means constant traffic at that time. So how does an Ethernet frame look like? Well. It has a maximum length of 1,500 octets or bytes. And I really, really checked the sources. I couldn't find where that number came from. The only thing I found was that it was a compromise between they wanted to have be as long as possible and they needed fast memory in network cards for the pre-processing and fast memory was expensive. So they somehow agreed that 1,500 bytes is a reasonable maximum length for an Ethernet frame. So what else do we have here? We have, uh, uh, we have a preamble. It's 101010. That means, listen, something is coming. And at the end of the preamble, it stops the rhythm of one zero and with one one. That means for the network card, now it's really starting. And the next thing is the destination MAC address. That's the Ethernet address where this packet is sent to, the destination of the frame. And uh, the network card listened to that and if it's not for me well just ignore all the rest then we have the source mac address that's the mac address the ethernet address of the sender then we have a thing called ether type or length the standard was changed at the time it was length at the beginning uh, the length of the frame and then it was changed to ether type and ether type is um, 16 bits which identify the payload so is there an ip packet in the payload or is there something else there are you can transport other protocols other than ip also via ethernet so this gives you the information what's inside the payload then we have the payload which is the data up to 1500 bytes and at the end we have a checksum and that also could be processed by the network card. If the checksum is incorrect, we can throw it away. Addressing. Addresses in Ethernet. And uh, these are called Ethernet addresses or MAC addresses, and they are 48 bit long, and uh, they are managed by the IEEE, that's the internet, uh, something association with electrical engineers, I, something like that. And they uh, basically manage Ethernet and they uh, also 
take care of all the Ethernet standards and they also manage the address space. And unlike uh, uh, internet, you purchase blocks of addresses. If you want to manufacture an Ethernet card, you can purchase a block of Ethernet addresses, you can use them and then you purchase the next block. And uh, Ethernet addresses are written like this with colons, hexadecimal numbers, or they are written like this, or they are written like this. These are all valid notations of Ethernet addresses. What's in an address? Of course, there are some special bits. There is a local admin bit that's like the private IP addresses. So local means that is an Ethernet address somebody has assigned itself and it might not be globally unique. If it is zero, this bit, then it's a globally unique address. And uh, that unique means it's usually burned in to the hardware by the manufacturer. How unique are they? Well, there was once a company in the 1990s or early, uh, it, quite some time ago, who thought, ah, well, express addresses are expensive. We are selling our hardware all over the world. Why can't we reuse the addresses we sell in Asia, also in Europe? Oh, well, of course it didn't work. Asian network cards found their way to European networks and suddenly they were two cards with the same network on the on, uh, same address on the network. And that, of course, is a collision. So globally unique means globally unique. Each Ethernet uh, address should be only exist only one time and there's another special bit that's uh, unicast and multicast and i'm not talking about this today and there's a special address that's the so-called broadcast address remember that i told you ethernet is a broadcast medium so everybody listens anyway if you want to send something which has to be received by everybody you can put in a broadcast address and that's received by all Ethernet nodes. The Ether type uh, that uses values higher than 1500. Why? Well, the Ether type field was reused length field. So if there is a value less than 1500, it is the length. If there is a value higher than 1,500, it's an ESA type. Yeah, it's a hack. Well, some well-known ESA types, IPv4 uses hexadecimal 800, IPv6 uses 86DD. Talking about more about ESA type in the next talk. So Ethernet today. We are all using it in data centers. We have these massive boxes using optical fibers. There are various types of fibers. They're so-called single mode fibers or multi-mode fibers. And the speeds are up to 400 gigabit per second. And the connection is between a so-called switch and an end device. So in modern Ethernet, we no longer have the coax cable. We have a kind of star-like topology with a central device in the middle. And you're using these kind of cables. Speeds are usually 100 megabit per second or one gigabit per second, and uh, also with a central device. And of course, there's wireless ethernet, and I'm not talking about that. So remember the drawing of uh, Ethernet with the big yellow cable. And like I said, that's no longer used. The first step away from the cable was so-called hubs. And a hub is simply the cable in a box. It behaves exactly the same way. So uh, what you receive on 
one port is broadcasted on all other ports. So basically just like the cable. But why do I have it broadcasted out on all ports if I know on which port a certain device is? And this was the Ethernet switch. And it's dusty because I took it out of my cupboard. So this is the common, the most used Ethernet device of today. And the advantage is it learns what devices are connected to which port and only sends out frames to ports where the receiver device is connected to. And it, if it doesn't know that, well, it falls back to the old behavior, like it broadcasts it on all ports until it has learned on which port the device is connected to. Yes, the hub is also a repeater. It's, it takes care that the signal is a bit amplified. Yeah, Ethernet still, like in the old days, has usually a payload size of maximum 1,500 octets. There do exist so-called jumbo frames with up to 9,000 octets, but they are not that commonly used. Ethernet still uses 48-bit addresses, but today uh, it's no longer really a broadcast medium, but switches are used and connections are point to point. Our model here, we are on the link layer and remind you data units are called frames and this provides point to point transfer. So illusion about Ethernet. This is the thing, like I said, you should remember from this part. Ethernet is a broadcast network. It uses 48-bit addresses and uh, they should be globally unique. And usually Ethernet frames are 1,500 bytes long. And with that, I am at the end of part about Ethernet. So if there are any questions, uh, Richie, please let me know. Okay, let's go one step, one step at a time. This one I actually wrote quite late. So this is because it's called number 2A. It's still uh, uh, in the Ethernet layer and uh, talking about so-called VLANs. So we are still talk about Ethernet. And uh, let's see a typical Ethernet installation in an office building or at home. You have your router somewhere, your Fritz box or whatever. That's where the internet comes in. Uh, you connect the floors. You might have a switch on each floor. Uh, not a lot of people have at home. Well, I do, but uh, Usually people don't, and uh, I'm not talking about wireless today. Uh, you have a switch on each floor, and uh, you might have also a switch in a larger office where about more than one person sits, and this is all interconnected uh, by Ethernet. And the enters are connected to the switches. And uh, remind, remember the last presentation, Ethernet. Well, it's a shared medium. So all devices are connected to a shared medium, and basically all devices can receive this thing. But, uh, well, you might want to have a second network because, well, for guests or for telephony. And, uh, how to do that? Well, or, or, or the third options for these called things to connect, which you don't really control and don't really understand. So let's talk about how to implement a guest network here. 
Well, of course, you can duplicate everything. You put in a second switch, you put in a second infrastructure, you put in uh, additional Ethernet cables to interconnect all that. Well, uh, is there an easier way? Well, yes, there is. And for that, we can use VLANs. VLANs are virtual LANs. And to understand how they work, let's have a look again at the Ethernet frame. We have the ESA type and we have, let's say we want to set up these VLANs and uh, we are putting in the ESA type of 8100 hex and that means the frame is VLAN tagged. And the header changes a bit. So if the ESA type is 8100. The header gets a little bit longer. We add two fields. One is the number of the VLAN, and the other one is the real ESA type of the payload. So that's the so called VLAN header. The first 16 bit are 8100, just to let the receiver know that this is a VLAN header. Then we have three bits priority and uh, one drop bit. And at the end, we have 12 bits for a VLAN ID. So we have quite a number of VLANs, more than 4,000. And of course, after that, we have an ESA type telling the receiver what kind of payload we have. Four thousand VLAN IDs. This, that means you can have multiple VLANs. Well, actually, more than four thousand of them on one physical infrastructure. You simply tag your frames to which VLAN they belong, and uh, the connections, the interconnections between the switches. Well, they can have one or multiple VLANs on that, and if they have more than one VLAN, we call them a trunk. So how to set that up? How does it work? Remember that we have switches in the Ethernet. And uh, what we do, what the switches do, they connect devices to each other. So you plug in your computer to one of these switch ports. You interconnect, you connect also one switch to the other. Standard ports, this is the normal Ethernet without any VLAN. So simply you connect your switches, you connect your computers, you connect everything together and each device can reach each other device. Now let's add VLANs to that mix. What you need to do on your switches, you need to configure your switch that there is a VLAN on a certain port. So first here we have a port where there is only a computer connected and we tell it it's a so-called access port. Access port means we are sending and receiving standard Ethernet frames but still we want to belong that port to one specific VLAN. And here we have VLAN 10 and VLAN 20. So we configure the access port into a VLAN and say they belong to VLAN 10 or VLAN 20. And we do that for each port which is in use. Then we have the ports interconnecting the switches. And here we tell the switch, this is a port where we want to have more than one VLAN on. We say it's a trunk port and a trunk port means keep the VLAN tag on the frame. And I'm telling also the switch which VLANs are allowed on that trunk. Of course, you can also say any VLAN is allowed. So here we have the trunks interconnecting the switches. 
And here on this switch, on the rightmost switch, we only have uh, systems connected to VLAN 20. So on the trunk, we don't need VLAN 10. So we configure the trunk only to allow VLAN 20. And for easy reading, I marked the trunk ports with a T. So here we have a trunk with both VLANs, and here we have a trunk with only one VLAN. What's still missing? Connecting to your router. So we have two options here. If the router understands trunks like a modern industry router does, you can simply connect your router to a trunk port and the router takes care of tagging the Ethernet frames and putting the right uh, data, the right content into the right VLAN. That's the mod well, that's, that's the type of routers you usually do not have at home. The routers you do usually have at home, like a Fritz box, you can say, oh, we have one port for your guest LAN and you have one port for your home LAN. And you connect them to two ports on the switch, which are also access port. That means the frames are not tagged, but they still belong to a VLAN. So this is how to connect your, how to build actually a VLAN tagged home network. And this is kind of the similar to the network I have at home. I have a separate guest network, a different VLAN. But now, how does it work? I said about tagging and uh, access ports and trunk ports. So let's see how uh, a frame travels through the network. First example will be communicating within the home network. So we, here we have an Ethernet frame. Uh, this is sent by this box here. It's sent to the switch. The switch adds the VLAN tag and just marking it green, sends it over to the top switch and sends it to the destination. And before it sends it out to the destination, the VLAN taken off. That's done by the switch. The standard Ethernet frame to the destination. So the destination do not even know that they are on a VLAN tagged network. The switches are taking care of that. And the same happens within the home network. So, uh, well, sorry, guest network to the internet is the second example. I should learn my own presentations. So again, we have an Ethernet frame, uh, standard untagged, it's sent to the switch. The VLAN tag is, tag is added. It's sent over the trunk. It's sent to the router. And since the router doesn't use VLAN tagged interfaces, it takes the VLAN tag off and it sends standard Ethernet frame to the router and up to the internet. Okay, VLANs at DKIX. Well, I created all these presentations for DKIX, so there should be a DKIX example in there. Uh, what do, does DKIX use VLANs for? Well, VLANs can deliver multiple LANs on one trunk port. You already have learned that. And each of them is tagged with a different VLAN ID. And like we did this home and guest network, and uh, we can also use another things network. Well, at DKIX, we have these big, big, big edge devices. And what we do is we connect customers to them. And in the very old days, it was simply an Ethernet switch, and we were simply delivering Ethernet. But uh, the standard still is an untagged access port and you can use it to peer, for example, in Frankfurt. But we can also attack port to customers and we can deliver 
different services like Frankfurt peering service with a VLAN of 20, like a Madrid peering service with a VLAN ID of 30, and like a New York or wherever else peering service with a VLAN of 45. And we can also use that to connect uh, customers with in between each other, and we can also use that for cloud service providers. And the nice thing about this industry, great edge devices we are using, we can rewrite the VLAN tag, so the VLAN tag does not have to be the same on each side. And uh, that's how DKIX uses VLANs. Okay, conclusion, and please remember about VLANs. VLANs are used to set up virtual LANs on one physical infrastructure. And uh, they have IDs and the VLAN IDs run from uh, one to four zero ninety four, so quite a lot. And uh, why is it not recommended to use VLAN one? Well, VLAN one is often pre-configured out of the box. So just imagine you have VLAN one for something really, really critical and somebody packs out a new device, gets a new device and before he does any uh, configuring, hooks it up to your production network and it starts doing things in VLAN one. You don't want that. So VLAN one is often pre-configured in new devices, might do strange things. So please, if you can, do not use VLAN one in production. Then you are a little bit safer against things happening. All right, and uh, here we go again for questions. Do we have any questions? Okay, I see your questions. Are all home routers nowadays use VLAN tagging already against towards the ISP for separation of IP, VoIP, and TV? No. Home routers often use DSL to connect to ISPs, and DSL is a complete different ballgame. Some do, but on the inside, I haven't seen a reasonable home router being a, on the inside. I haven't seen any reasonable home router able to do VLANs. The Fritz box does not. It has two physical ports, one for guests, one for home. Are there any tips about choosing VLAN IDs? Yes, start from two and count upwards. Longer explanation. Do not give VLAN IDs any meaning because you might have the greatest numbering scheme on earth, uh, like start guest lands from 10 upwards, like start uh, uh, long lands from 100 upwards. Whatever scheme you have, it will break in, perhaps not today, but in two, three, four, five years, it will break and you have to start doing exceptions. So don't do any scheme, start with two, document everything and just count upwards. Okay. I didn't check the chat if there are questions, but these were the questions I'm seeing here on the question pane. And the idea about not in numbering schemes, the same goes for IP addresses, the same goes for IPv6 networks. Whatever scheme you are thinking of, it will break. I've seen it. All right. And with that, uh, talking about IP. So we are one hour in. Wow, fantastic. And I'm at part three already. Good. <laughs> talking about IP, the internet protocol. And uh, yeah, explanation, I will skip over that. I forgot to remove these slides because what is a protocol I already told you. And uh, 
skipping over them. And also the protocol stack. We already talked about that. We talked about the physical layer, the link layer, the uh, and we are now going, I should have removed these slides. Oh, well, doesn't matter. We are now talking about the content of the payload in Ethernet. So now it gets started. It starts getting interesting again. And I already said that we have a protocol stack, like multiple protocol building upon each other. We have packets inside frames or packets inside packets. And the payload of Ethernet in this case is IP, Internet Protocol. And what we do here is called encapsulation. And encapsulation, it's like all these Russian dolls. You have them all inside each other and you can repeat that quite a lot. So in this case, we have an IP packet and that's inside an Ethernet frame. That's in the payload of an Ethernet frame. And we are now here on layer three on the internet layer. Data units here are called packets. And the internet layer, the purpose it provides end to end, so source to destination transport. And for that, of course, we need addresses. And we have two protocols on that layer being used today. One is called IPv4 and the other one is called IPv6. So let's get started with IPv4. IPv4, again, it has a header and it has a payload. You might ask what happened to IPv5 or IPv2? Is there an IPv8? Let me show you how the IPv4 header looks like. We have the version information at the beginning. And for IPv4, well, there is a four in the version field. So what happened to the other ones? Zero and one are reserved. Two and three were never used. Uh, well, that's version four. And there was a protocol called the Internet Stream Protocol, which was defined, but I haven't seen it in practice. And that got number five. IPv6 is used. IPv7, that's a protocol I found called TPIX. I have no idea what that is. Eight and nine are also historic and there are quite a few numbers left. So people say the next protocol, I doubt that there ever will be one, will be IPv10. I have no idea if it really will happen. In the version field for IPv4, there is a four and there's also IPv6. That's the only protocols currently existing. All right, the IPv4 header, it starts with the version number and the header lengths and uh, also has the total length of the packet in there. Stop. 65,535. No, that doesn't fit into an Ethernet frame. More to that later. Then we so-called time to live field. That's a counter starting when the packet is created, decreased every time the packet is forwarded. And if it hits zero and hasn't reached its destination, the packet is thrown away. More to that later. Then the protocol field, and that's similar to the payload field in Ethernet because that tells your system what kind of payload this packet has. Yeah, and we have a header checksum and we have the source and destination IPv4 address. Both are 32 bits long and uh, you've all seen them. Then we have optional header fields, 
not talking about them today. Let's have a look at IPv6. And you have seen the IPv4 header, it has a length field. So the IPv4 header has variable lengths. And that's bad because if anything in a computer system has a variable length, you need to do some conditional processing. So the idea of this IPv6 was, uh, it was one of the ideas, make the header field a fixed length that makes processing easier. And also, if you have a look at the IPv6 header, it looks le way less complicated. At the beginning, of course, we have the version number of six, and uh, then we have some flags and labels I don't want to talk about today. And uh, the next one again is the payload length in bytes. Again, it can be very long. And then we have a nice thing called the next header field. The next header field replaces the protocol field. And since we know that this IPv6 header has a fixed length, we already we also know where the next header starts. It just gives you the type uh, of next header here. Then we have a field called the hop limit. And that is the same as the time to live. They just changed the name because, well, time to live, it isn't the time in seconds or in minutes or whatever. It is really the number of hops a packet might travel. And then we said, oh, okay, we need a way larger address space. So we are using 128 bits address fields in length. So us in this version IP v6 address and that's the whole ipv6 header it's really really simpler before addresses well you all know them you've seen them they are 32 bits in uh, you might have heard of class rp and c addresses please forget that there is no such thing anymore since 1993 and uh, if you have people teaching that well they should really retire so there is no thing that class a and b, b a b and c addresses uh, all usable ipv4 addresses are considered equal usable means there is part of the ipv4 address space which is not considered to be usable because at the beginning when it was defined it was reserved for future applications which means uh, that all systems said okay that's not a valid address and this future application never came but the code noting that it's unusable was never taken out of uh, the system so not all part of the ipv4 address space is usable Thirty-two bit in length. That means we have some. Uh, That's the number of addresses. I'm not reading that out. Uh, addresses are written as decibel numbers, uh, separated by dots. And like I said, some addresses are reserved and not used. All usable IPv4 addresses have been handed out to users to ISPs. There is no unusable IP before address space left. So if you uh, need IP before addresses, you have to buy them on the market. Or you can get lucky if put yourself on a waiting list and perhaps you get some IP before address space. And so please do IPv6. If people say IPv6, that's the new ad IP protocol. Well, the development for IPv6 started in 1994 and it was first published in 1995. So it's not new. It's perhaps unfortunately not as commonly used, but it's not new. Talk about IPv6 addresses.
IPv6 addresses, they said, oh, we have to. the main problem IPv4 is that there are not enough addresses. So let's make them long. Let's make them real. 128 in that there are plant addresses available. Then is then IPv4. We are using hexadecimal numbers, so zero to nine, and then letters A to F. Uh, we group four digits together and separate them by colons, not by dots. So that's a valid IPv6 address up there. And uh, if the address contains lots of zeros, there we make a short version. So double colon means fill up by zeros. So these three on the lower right, they're all the same IPv6 address. And uh, there can be only one double zero in an address uh, because otherwise you wouldn't mean where to put how many zeros. So that's IPv6 addresses, the uh, short version. Also, again, some addresses are reserved and not usable. Internet protocol, IP. How did it start? History, I love history. Uh, it started actually in the 1960s. This is, oh, that's way before Ethernet. Yes, it is. And it was not invented to survive a thermonuclear war. That's a myth and that's wrong. But it was funded by DARPA and DARPA uh, is, was an agency of the Ministry of Defense in the US. So it was a military research agency, but it wasn't funded to survive a war. It was, it was created to share resources because a lot of universities were just were asking for funding like today. They wanted to have money uh, to build uh, nice big supercomputers and uh, the uh, funding agency said, okay, uh, we do not give every university money to build a supercomputer each. We gave a few of them, you build the supercomputer, but you have to share it with everybody else. And if you want to share computing resources, you needed a network. And to interconnect these research sites, well, basically that was the birth of IP, of the IP protocol. Timeline, not a lot of people are aware how old actually that is. In 1961, the first concept of a packet switching network was described. In 1967, that's, uh, I was one year old at that time, the plan, the first plan for the ARPANET was written down. And in 1969, the first ARPANET node was built. So that's how old the predecessor of the internet really is. And this all was first publicly demonstrated in 1972. Well, TCP IP, it was not, at that time, it was not called IP and TCP, it was really called TCP IP uh, was described in 1974. And also at around that time, the term internet was used for time. In 1983, the ARPANET uh, switched from the predecessor of IP from the NCP protocol to TCP IP in one night. Well, that would be like changing all of the internet from IPv4 to IPv6 in one night. Well, wouldn't happen today, but it was way smaller. So why was IP or the internet protocol so successful? Remember, like in Ethernet, it wasn't the only network at that time. It wasn't the only network protocol at that time, but it is still used today. So there are quite a number like, uh, do you remember BitNet or DECnet? And I talked about OZ. Well, the fun one factor is the IP protocols were evolving way more quickly. So 
a lot of people at university started implementing, started writing code, started uh, defining new protocols. And the key factor from my point of view is the openness, the openness of documentation. There are no patents, there are no license fees. All documentation is publicly available. Try getting an ISO standard or a German DIN norm. You have to pay or try getting other uh, computing protocols. Uh, you have to either you have to pay or you have to become member of a quite exclusive club. Never with the internet. All documentation of the internet is and always was open and freely available. The standards of the internet are called RFC, and RFC stands for Request for Comment. Uh, there are nowadays, I think, up to 8,000 of these RFCs. Each has a number, and uh, to get a specification published as an RFC, there is a process. Uh, everybody can basically publish an RFC. In theory, you have to put in a lot of work. You have to convince a number of people. There are a lot of stages for doing that, but RFCs were and are still open. So the entity doing that is called the IATF, that's the Internet Engineering Task Force. If you want to have a look up how it works, check uh, either rfc-editor.org or check iatf.org. And uh, also, if you download the slides, at the end I have a, quite a long list of links to RFCs and also to the publishing process. So that's it. Nearly about IP, a conclusion, but you should remember the IP protocols take care of end-to-end -end communication. Today, IPv4 and IPv6 both coexist in the network and IP packets have a header and the payload, and basically that's true for nearly any kind of uh, system protocols. They usually always have a header and have a payload. And IPv4 uh, and IPv6 headers are different, but both contain source and destination addresses. And uh, I don't have to repeat what uh, IP addresses are. And about the payload, of course, the payload with all this encapsulation can be yet another protocol and usually is another protocol. And with that, I am open again for questions. Okay, I don't see any questions. Uh... VLAN tagging, that was from the last part. Uh, Richie, can you archive that, please? All right. Okay, if there are no questions, let's continue with IP. And uh, we stay on this layer because IP is so much more than just a packet with an address. So I'm now talking about again about IP addresses, prefixes, and routing. And I'm skipping over a few slides because we already did that. IP before address uh, like there. Yeah, I did IP with addresses that the layout is a little bit later. So here, uh, fill up with zero. Okay, now this is new end to end transport. Like I said, the IP layer is responsible for end to end support. This is not how the internet looks like. No direct circuit between Frankfurt and Australia, at least not that I know of. End-to-end -end transport doesn't mean you have a direct line 
from everywhere to everywhere. It's not like uh, taking an airplane. There are many, many, many devices all over the world, which are, some of them are interconnected. And if you want to send data from Australia to Frankfurt, send by hop from one device to the next one, to the next one, and it reaches its destination. And it takes a certain path over the network. But how does it find its way? And that's what IP addresses are for. We know that each device has an IP address and uh, the packet has a destination IP address in it. So what happens? If a packet arrives at one of these nodes, this node must have a kind of a pointer where to send the packet on. And uh, it does. And it knows that if the packet has a destination address, like a uh, colon five at the end, it has it through which interface it has to be sent out. And it looks that up in a big, big table and sends out the packet through a specific interface to the next node. And this repeats until the packet arrives at the destination. And this is what we call routing. I'm having a short intermission here, talking about language. I'm not a native speaker. I do speak a lot of English, but I'm German. Uh, how to pronounce routing? If you go to school, you might talk here, talk people about routing. That's correct. But it, routing is also correct. And routing is a method of finding paths from origins to destination in the networks. And uh, why do I say routing? instead of routing to avoid complications. I'm using routing because on a system, the super user is also called, called root. And routing, if it's written with two O's, means a hole formed uh, by a pick when it roots into the ground. And we are not doing that. We are routing packets. So this is why I say routing. And for routing, we use a router. And how does it work? Like I said, all of the IP packets, they do have a destination IP address. And what I tell here, it's true for IPv4 and IPv6. I'm just using IPv6 example addresses. But in IPv4, it works just the same way. And depending on that destination IP address, the router chooses a next hop. So routing happens hop to hop. And for this, the router has a large lookup table, a large routing table, is it called? And uh, But this routing table, it doesn't contain billions and billions of IP addresses. That would be way too much. You cannot put each system on the internet into a table, <laughs> large. It doesn't contain single addresses. It contains so-called prefixes. So what is a prefix? Another one we have to learn. If we see an IP address, which is 128 bits long in IPv6, uh, this address has a so-called network part and a host part. And in this case, the network part is 64 bits long and it's, it is written with a slash and a number after the prefix. So we have a slash 64 IPv6 network here. That means the network part 
64 bit long, the host part is all zeros. The complete address 128 bits long, host part all zero, network part 64 bit long. This is true for IPv4. The writing is a bit different. Also here we have a host part, we have a network part, and in this case the network part is 22 bits long. We write it slash 22. And again, the network part, the host part is all zero and the boundary between network part and host part can be anywhere. And that's also true for IPv4 and IPv6. If you compare both of them, V4 and V6, uh, the, uh, well, I've done it before, I don't have to repeat it. IPv4 32 bits, IPv6 128 bits, and uh, the network part is plus the length makes up a prefix. And uh, this is then used for routing. So let's have a look inside a router. A packet arrives and the router has two options where to send it on. And it looks into its routing table and checks for the best match against of the destination address against the table. And this, in this case, is the best match. And you would say the other one matches as well. Yes, that's correct. But the best match is also the one where the network part is has the most bits in it. Small is a bit bad term here. The network part in the second one has 24 bits and this is called more specific than one with the network part of 16 bits. So this is the best match packet is sent out through this interface here. And that's what happens when it is routed. So to see again how it works in detail, what we do first usually, well, of course, that isn't implemented that way. That's just an example. How it's implemented in a router is the secret of the manufacturer. So what I'm doing here is I'm first sorting all these prefixes in my routing table by lengths. So the where the network part is longest, I put first. And then I go line by line. I try to match the destination address against the prefix. That means I'm applying the net mask here to the destination address, masking it out. I do a bitwise logical end with the mask. I'm doing the same. Take fix. It's a slash 24. I'm masking it out with the destination address. Here is the mask destination address. And hey, it's the same. So I'm using this entry for routing. I say you now know how routing works, but it will. It is complicated if you have never seen it before. So uh, take your time, look to the slides, and uh, also a good source for that, have a look at the Wikipedia entry. But in principle, the router has a table with all the IP prefixes and the destination address is used to select a best matching prefix. And that tells the router the next hop. But how is this table being filled? How does the information get in there? 
Well, one option would be that somebody types it in, and that is what we call static routing. So we're typing in routing information into a router. It's simple. It's quite often used, but well, it doesn't scale. You don't want to type 800,000 prefixes into a router. The other way is the routers talk to each other. And this is what we call dynamic routing. And the protocols used for that, well, they're called routing protocols. And yesterday I gave a workshop about uh, the BGP routing protocol, which is the main routing protocol for the internet. Examples, routing protocols, you might have heard them before. Well, BGP, OSPF, ISIS, RIP, EGRP, and a number more. So conclusion about routing introduced quite a lot in this part. Uh, introduced what routing is, introduced the term router and also IP prefix and routing table. So time for questions. Thank you, Niels. Yes, somebody told me, why don't you start with IPv6? And uh, yes, that's what I, why I'm doing that. Usually I like IPv4 examples because it's way easier to read out the addresses. IPv6, you have to talk so much. Okay, next part. There are none which I can see, but I also lack like Okay. Yeah, uh, there is quite some 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 lagging here in the I think in the transmission. I hope that at least my slides and my voice is halfway in sync. Okay, again routing. This time I called that global IP routing, and that's a little bit more like the other one. And I'm skipping over the first slides again addresses previous network part prefix lengths ipv4 prefix lengths and we've seen that as example before so how to deliver a letter to australia you send it hop by hop and you already learned about how routing really works So all these blue boxes are routers. But not every of these routers is operated by a different person or company. Usually internet service providers operate quite a number of routers. They either operate globally or in a certain region or in a, a part of a country, whatever. And these entities, these groups here, this is what we call an autonomous system. And uh, I know that is, that is not the formal definition. And an autonomous system is kind of invisible. In the, the inside of an autonomous system is kind of invisible to the outside. The only thing you know about these autonomous systems are with IP addresses they are announcing. So they are announcing IP prefixes between each other and say, I have these IP uh, prefix inside my autonomous system, send me traffic. History, how did it start? I love history. I love internet history. I'm a bit part of it. Well, 1990s, uh, gigabit per second was a really, really fast connection network in 1997. In the 1990s was 34 megabits per second. End users, like users at home, if they were fast, were using 64 kilobit ISDN. 
standard connection for home users was a modem. That's the third, third, third thing for your telephone line. For businesses, the standard speed was, like I said, 64 kilobit per second. Germany in the 1990s, there were three reasonably big commercial ISPs in Germany. And of them, they had a connection to the US. That's where the main part of the internet was. And uh, if they want to exchange traffic with each other, they go over the Atlantic twice in worst case. And these circuits were expensive. And I'm talking about circuits with speeds, uh, which makes you smile like 19 kilobits per second or something like this. So the idea was we are three ISPs in Germany and why don't we change exchange traffic directly? We can do the cables, of course, but cables were also expensive. There was just one big cable provider and that means they had the license to print money. And uh, each of these three ISPs was in a different city um, and cables, like I said, were really expensive. So why not meet in the middle? And uh, the middle, logically, perhaps not 100% geographically, was Frankfurt. And so DKIX was born. DKIX started direct connections between commercial providers to so simply to exchange traffic, exchanging traffic for only their own and their customers. And this is what we call peering. Exchanging traffic between providers only between their own systems and their customers' systems. You can look it up. It made its way to, way to the dictionaries. Uh, and uh, of course, it also has a Wikipedia entry nowadays. So let's have a look at a typical internet service provider. Typical internet service provider has quite a mix of customers. We have domestic customers, we have businesses, we have home users, and today we also have mobile users. And this internet provider purchases connectivity from another bigger internet provider. If he's smart, he purchases from two internet providers because of redundancy. And they also might purchase from somebody else and uh, somehow it's connected to all the big thing called internet. And let's have a look at the second one. It's not so smart, so he only has one. Uh, internet provider uplink, which is interconnected also all over the world. So if they want to exchange traffic, what happens? You remember routing. The traffic is sent hop to hop from one router to the next router until it makes its way down to the green internet provider and to the end user. So both of them making other people rich by sending traffic over their networks. Why not interconnect directly like this? So with this connection in place, like I said, the routers talk to each other. They learn what is what IP prefix is connected to which interface. So the traffic now goes directly between these two. That's way more efficient and way faster. They are not the only ones interconnected here. The top two providers are also interconnected. So peering doesn't happen only on one level. It happens on multiple levels. Here again, we have an interconnection between these two top providers. And if we draw all this a little bit differently, we have a so-called peering hierarchy. Peering on multiple level 
usually peering happens between equal sized networks and size can be geographical size business size importance whatever so uh on all levels and the top ones are called tier one networks and they only peer with each other have a look at the wikipedia entry to about tier one networks it is sometimes a bit unclear who is a member of this club uh, have a look i don't know it changes from time to time but usually they try of course uh, that uh, no new members get into it because they, they want to keep this kind of club this tier one network club exclusive and they to, to be honest they also have to invest a lot of money uh, they have to have a large scope of their network and uh, but uh, like i said have a look at wikipedia so why peering what's it good for again historical view in the early days, peering was way, way cheaper than routing traffic via your upstream network. And also, it prevented traffic from crossing the Atlantic twice. Today, peering, well, upstream prices are down. So it's not necessarily always cheaper, but it's still important because uh, it reduces latency and it keeps your traffic under control. If you operate a router, even with all the automation and routing protocols, you still, you as an operator, still have lots of influence which way your traffic takes. So you can say, I want to go this traffic via peering, this other traffic via my upstream provider. And uh, of course, at an internet exchange, you can peer with a lot of other networks and uh, participants and all participants if they want to peer with you peering is always an agreement between two parties and uh, even if you are present at an internet exchange it doesn't guarantee you that everybody will peer with you but like i said peering happens between equal or similar sized networks so there is a good chance that you can find a lot of peers at your local internet exchange so conclusion about global ip routing networks announce ip prefixes and ip packets are then sent or routed to these prefixes using the destination address peering is the exchange of traffic between similar sized networks and in the past it was mainly done to reduce cost nowadays it decreases latency and enhances control and internet exchanges of course are the place to be all right do we have any questions i don't see questions don't, but also you can't hear me oh we don't have any questions um for the back office uh please enable me to actually manage the questions because i'm currently flying a little bit blind all right okay I'm not sure if I can do everything, but at least I want to talk about UDP. So we were on the internet layer. We are now going one up to the transport layer. At the beginning, I told you about the transport layer. It may provide additional features, but it doesn't have to. And remember the slide about packet encapsulation. So we have protocols inside protocols inside protocols. And remember the IP presentation where I told you IP packets do have a payload. And commonly, this payload is usually UDP or TCP, but there are others as well. So for UDP, we have a UDP packet inside an IP packet inside an Ethernet frame. Let's have a look at the legacy IP header. This time we start with IP first. And we have these 
protocol field. And the value here defines what type of payload we have. And for UDP, the value is 17. For TCP, it's 6. That also shows you TCP is older than UDP because they started at 1. IPv6, we have the next header field and the values for this is quite the same. Why do I start with UDP in my presentation? Because, well, UDP is uh, the simplest transport layer protocol. UDP, it stands for User Datagram Protocol. The protocol ID is 17 and it was introduced in 1980. Like I said, TCP is older and it also has a header. Let's have a look. And this is the UDP header. It's very, very simple. It has four fields, each of them 16 bit long. And uh, one is the length field. The length field is the length of the UDP header plus the UDP payload. So everything. And uh, we have a checksum. The checksum is optional for IPv4, but required for IPv6. And in that checksum, not only the UDP header is covered, but also part of the IP header. And that's where one part where, uh, <coughs> sorry, where the layers are not strictly separated from each other. And we have two fields called ports. We have a source port and we have a destination port. So what is a port number? Just have a look at a building when you want to deliver a letter. And uh, the postman goes to the building, sees a lot of letter boxes, and the building is kind of uh, your system with its IP address. But to which of these letter boxes does the letter have to be delivered? And that's where the port number comes in place. Each of these apartments in the building has, of course, a number. And uh, we have a destination port. And that means here that goes to apartment number seven. And that's building, computer, port number. It's all quite the same. So in reality, port numbers are applications running on your system. And uh, they each have a port number. And the port numbers go from, well, 16 bit, they go from zero to 65,000 something. And between each of these ports, there sits a piece of software. And on some systems, Linux systems, this software is called a daemon. So an IP packet arrives, it arrives at your system because it's the IP address. And then it, the port number comes into place. And the port number tells the system to which of these pieces of software it has to deliver the packet. UDP is called uh, connectionless protocol. Why is it so? Because the sender doesn't know if and when the packet has been received. So I'm just sending out a UDP packet and I hope it gets through. There might be an answer to the UDP packet, but there might not. So I, as a sender of a UDP packet, have no information if the packet has been received. Well, if there is an answer, of course I know, but if there is no answer, the packet might get lost. The receiver might have ignored it. I don't know. Or yeah, of course, or the answer didn't get through. So I have no information if I don't get an answer. And this is called connectionless communication. 
So, and that also has a problem with security. IPv4 and the old internet was never designed with security in mind. The UDP packet has port numbers and a response is being sent to the sender of the packet. But how do I know if the sender IP address is the right one? So I'm sending a packet with an sender address and destination address, the packet goes back. If I'm a good guy, I put in my own sender address so I can get a response. But if I'm a bad guy, I put in somebody else's sender address and the response goes elsewhere. Let's talk about what UDP is actually used for. One example is the so-called network time protocol. That's a protocol to synchronize clocks over the internet. Another protocol where UDP is used for is DNS, the domain name service. That's the service which translates names like the name of a web server to an IP address. And that's also commonly used via UDP, sending out a request, getting back a reply. Another example is DHCP, the Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. This is basically if you connect your computer to a new network, how you get an IP address and uh, also uses UDP for that and broadcast. I don't want to get, go into that much detail. I only have seven minutes left. So what does it all have to do with security? The normal UDP communication is request and answer, which might be unreliable. I'm sending out a UDP packet with a source address, source port, destination address, destination port, and I get an answer back. And the answer might be bigger packet-wise than the question. UDP as an attack tool, well, you fake the request. So you're putting in not your own source address, but somebody else's. You're sending it out and somebody else gets the reply. And you see that the reply is bigger than the request, and that's a so-called amplificated attack. So we amplify the traffic. We're sending out small questions, getting big answers, but the big answers don't get to us, but to someone we want to attack. And that's one of the security problems with UDP. Because you're sending these requests not only to one system, sending them to a lot of systems. You're sending a lot of requests to a lot of systems and they all send their replies to the attack target. Not so good. Examples for that. And yes, it really happened. Memcache daemon was one of these uh, badly implemented pieces of software. And it's simply a memcache daemon simply caches some information, some objects, and you send a UDP packet and uh, you get uh, the object. And uh, memcache daemon uh, was an amplification factor of 51,000. You can one small UDP packet and you get a 51,000 byte packets or a number of packets summing up, summing up to 51,000 bytes back to your target. So that's quite an amplification. NTP also had a weakness called, uh, they had a monlist command. You could ask via UDP, get me this list and also that amplifies from a small packet to a large. Okay, 
conclusion about UDP. UDP is a connectionless protocol. You don't know if it arrives at your target. You don't know if you don't get a reply, you have no idea why. In UDP packets, they're also called datagrams and the UDP header, it contains a source and a destination port number. And it can be used for attacks, which is not good. Yeah, and uh, because of that, or also because of uh, it's called unreliable, more and more services which used to use UDP are now moved to TCP or are re-implemented using TCP. And I guess that's it for today because uh, time's up. Uh, if you download the slides, you also will find a presentation about TCP, about ICMP, other protocols. So, uh, and they're also on the DKIX website. So the missing parts I couldn't do today, but I couldn't talk any faster. <laughs> uh, I already was quite fast, I think. Uh, you can watch on the DKIX website or you can simply have a look at the slides. We'll also be able to link the uh, full slides in on GitHub and such, so um, everyone can can see everything. And yeah, thank you very much, Wolfgang. Um, sorry for all the technical uh, funniness. Uh, I couldn't really see the questions, and also I only now found out why I had a huge delay and messed this up a little bit. Uh, we'll have roughly one minute of break, one and a half minutes of break. Um, so if you need to refill your coffee or bring your old coffee away, um, now's the time. And see you in a few. All right. Thank you.